So, my dear brothers in Islam, as we're doing Surah Al Hadid, uh, the name of the Surah itself is Hadid, meaning iron, because uh, in this Surah, Allah SWT talks to us about the iron as a miracle. But the first seven verses here they specifically deal with the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his beautiful names, his majesty, his honor, his, his respect, and um, and glorifying him. Uh, this is one of the surahs known as Musabbahat, which means that the surah starts off with glorifying Allah. You would find in, in these such surahs, the first word will be Sabbaha, or Yusabbihu, because Sabbaha, Yusabbihu means to glorify Allah, to praise Allah, and to magnify his name and his honor and his dignity. So here, as you see in front on the screen, the first ayah, Whatever is in the heavens and the earth exalts Allah, meaning glorifies Allah. And of course, Allah is the almighty and all wise. Al-Aziz means mighty, and Hakim means wise. So what is Allah telling us in this first ayah is that Every creation of Allah, everything in this world, in the skies and the heavens and on the earth, glorifies Allah SWT. There is nothing that is not glorifying Allah SWT at all. And if we go to this slide, if you can see that when we talk about glorifying Allah SWT, it means that uh, we also have to glorify Allah SWT. Because if we are not glorifying Allah, then we are doing a kind of disobedience to Allah SWT. So it's an indirect way of giving us a hint that Allah is saying whatever is in the heavens and the earth is glorifying Allah. So why you, O Insan, are so slacking off and lazy and back in your uh, glorification to Allah SWT. In fact, there's another ayah in the Quran in Surah Bani Israel, Surah 17, where Allah SWT says that وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ وَلَكِنْ لَا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِيحَهُمْ Allah SWT is saying there is not a single thing on the face of this universe that does not glorify Allah. وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ Meaning every single thing glorifies Allah. وَلَكِنْ However, لا تفقهون. You, O oh, insan, you, O oh, human being, cannot comprehend, cannot understand tasbihahum, their glorification. For example, if you remember the incident of uh, Suleiman al-Islam and the ant, so that gives us an idea that even the ants are glorifying Allah. And he had the ability to listen to the ants, so he heard what she was, what they were saying when he was coming. But that is a sign that the trees, the mountains, the sun, the star, the moon, the galaxies, everything, the, the fish and then the marine life and the birds and animals and everything is glorifying Allah. And notice here that two of the names that is used in this ayah is Aziz and Hakim. Allah has 99 names as we know. And one of those 99 is Aziz, almighty, all powerful. Why Allah used this name over here is because to show us that whoever is glorifying Allah, Allah is the one who's taking care of them. Allah is all He is deserving of the tasbih. He is deserving of the glorification that his creations make for him because of his might, because of his power, because of his authority, because of his strength. And he also all wise, Hakim, meaning it is through his wisdom that he has given wisdom to his creations to remember their creator, remember him, remember Allah SWT. So let us move to the next ayah as we see here in Surah Hadid. Like I said in the beginning, that the first five, uh, first six verses in this Surah Hadid is all about glorifying Allah, it's all about the praises of Allah, it's all about describing Allah's authority, his respect, his honor, his dignity. Is kibriya as we say in Arabic. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying that Lahu mulku to him belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. The word mulk comes in really means dominion or ownership. Like one of the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Malikul Mulk. Malikul Mulk, the owner of the dominion. Mulk here literally means everything that exists in this whole universe. Whatever is in the heavens and the earth and the skies and the galaxies, as, as far as as you, we can think and imagine, that everything belongs to Allah. This is the meaning of mulk. And that is why from this word is also the word that comes malik. Malik yawmiddin. That we recite in Surah Fatiha. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman Rahim. Malik yawmiddin. He is the master of the day of judgment or the owner of the day of judgment. So, Lahu Mulku Samawatulard, to him belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth, meaning in his ownership is everything. Uh, why is Allah telling us this right in the second ayah in the beginning of the surah? Telling us that look, whatever is in this universe belongs to Allah. You, O Insan, or any creation, do not own anything. We are just given a kind of a trust that we are living here on in this earth or we're living in this universe so we are entrusted by allah to take care of these things and to live here and to enjoy the blessings over here and utilize the resources that is given but the owner of the resources is allah for example who owns the air allah who owns the water allah who owns the land it's allah and that is why we say this whole land belongs to allah it's not the countries or the visa or the passport this is what man-made things are there but a long, long time ago, you know, thousands of years ago, there was no such thing as that. People could travel along the earth wherever they want to go because the whole earth belongs to Allah. And that is why in Surah Nisa, in Surah 4, Allah Subhanahu says that he will tell the people, the angels will tell the people on the Yom Al-Qiyamah, those who were in, in doing injustices, those who were doing the dhum to themselves, the angels will say to them, Alam takun ardullahi wasi'atun fatuhajiru fiha. The angels will say to these oppressed people that uh, wasn't the earth of Allah so vast that you could migrate because these people are being punished because they did dhulm to themselves and did not obey Allah's law. So when they're being punished, so the angel is saying to them, you know, you could have migrated from the place where you could not practice Islam because the earth belongs to Allah. So that concept of ownership is being given to us in this ayah that Allah owns everything and that's why this is a very important concept into this technology and the era of environmental science and all that that who owns this earth who owns the resources of this earth the water the air the land and the seeds and the crops and everything it is Allah SWT. and therefore how it is to be utilized for the benefit of mankind benefit of humanity there should be no monopoly I mean there are so many concepts here of course I don't have that much time we have limited time tonight to go through this but if we just go in the details of these ayat it will be almost fudge time but of course we have to rush and move forward so Allah SWT, then after explaining his sifat his attribute of being the owner of the heavens and the earth he then tells us two more attributes or two more qualities or features of him which is yuhi wa yomit this is synonymous to his two names from the 99 names that we keep hearing al muhyi al mumit al muhyi al mumit al muhyi the giver of life al mumit the giver of death these are the two characteristics for god to be god remember when namrud was uh, uh, bargaining or arguing or debating discussing with uh, ibrahim salam and he said you know i am god i am you know i'm a god why don't you worship me. So what did uh, Ibrahim Islam say to him to make him speechless, to look like a checkmate, that he could not do anything more? He said, my, Allah, Ibrahim Islam said, my God can give life and death. And so he was going on to say, okay, I can give life and death too. So he tried to release somebody and he tried to give punishment to somebody and said, look, this is the way to give life and death. But Ibrahim Islam made him speechless by saying, my God, Allah brings the sun from the east. Why don't you bring it out from the west? And that's where he lost. Oh boy, the Levi Kafar, as Allah SWT says. So here, Mohi Mumid, meaning he's the giver of life and he's the giver of death. No one can give us life and no one can give us death. No matter what we do in this world, in terms of technology, in terms of medical science, in terms of medicine, pharmaceutical, 
you know, anatomy of the body, things, everything. Allah is the soul giver of life and soul giver of death. If we want life, we only ask and beg of Allah for life or health and healthy life. And Allah is able over everything. Or Allah is capable and competent over everything. So notice how this ayah is you know, split in three parts. Part number one, to him belongs the heavens and the earth. Part number two, he is the giver of life and death. And part number three, after telling us that he is the giver of life and death and owns everything in the heavens and the earth, Allah then tells us, that he is able of everything. Meaning in San, when you're reading this ayah, if you have the slightest doubt in your mind, in your heart, that Allah cannot do anything or cannot do some things, then here is the ayah Allah says, Wa huwa ala kulli qadir. He is able and capable over everything. Nothing is impossible for him. Just like we read in Surah Ikhlas, the next ayah is what? Allahu Samad. Allah Samad means what? Allah is free from any deficiencies. Allah is free from any kind of negativity. Allah is free from any kind of weaknesses. And not being able to do something is a sign of weakness. So Allah is denouncing that by saying, وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ means every single thing, everything that is possible to come in your imagination, whatever you can think of, that can Allah do this? Yes. Can Allah do that? Yes. Meaning there is nothing in our wildest imagination that is impossible for Allah because Allah is summit. Allah is self-sufficient, omnipotent, infinite, unlimited, without any restriction. And why is he that? As we see the next verse, it interconnects with the previous verse, verse number three, as we see. Again, four more names from the 99 names of Allah. If you keep counting the names in these first seven verses, there's about 12 to 13 different names of Allah that he mentioned. So this is why we see that Allah starts off this surah by saying, Sabbah alillahi. You know, you glorify Allah. Allah is, tell, is telling us about himself. Allah is describing his uh, his izzah, his maqam, his rutbah, so that in our hearts we develop and we build awe for Allah, you know, awe and love for Allah. That I am worshiping a God, worshiping Allah that is so high, so majestic, so honorable, so powerful, so capable, so invincible, everything. So Allah SWT says from the four names, Huwal Awwalu, He is the first, Wahuwal Akhru, and He is the last, Wahuwa Zahiru. And he is the apparent, and and he is hidden. In the Hajjud, Rasulullah used to make a dua every night in the Hajjud. And in the dua, he used to make, he used to start off with this word Allahumma antal awwalu laysa qabla ka shay, wa antal akhiru laysa ba'da ka shay, wa antal zahiru laysa duna ka shay, wa antal batinu laysa fawqa ka shay. Subhanallah, what a beautiful dua. And then he will end by saying, oh Allah, forgive me, forgive me, and forgive my sins. What does this dua mean? Allahumma antal awwalu laysa qabla Oh Allah, you are the first, there is nothing before you. Meaning you are the beginning, the beginning is from you. There is no beginning before you. you and you have no beginning because you are the beginning. You know, today, atheists and non-Muslims ask us many times when we are doing dawah, you know, where did God come from? Where did your God come from? You know, what's the beginning of God? And the simple answer to that question, my dear brothers in Islam, when you talk to somebody is God has no beginning because this very concept, when you say that God has a beginning, this very concept, it is going against the purpose of belief in God. Because why would you want to worship in a God that has a beginning? Because if God has a beginning, it makes God equal to us. Me and you, we have a beginning. Our beginning was the date of birth, the day we were born. We have an end. Our end is the day we die. Allah has no end and Allah has no beginning. He is the beginning. He is the end. And that is why some used to make that dua. Allahumma antal awwalu laysa qabla ka shay. Oh Allah, you are the first. There is nothing before you. Nothing came before him. When nothing existed, Allah existed. When nothing was in this whole universe, Allah was still there. And he is the last. When everything finishes, when everything perishes, Allah will still be there. Allah will not end. Because Allah is the beginning and the end. Everything ends with Allah. So when nothing is there, Allah is still there.
And that is why Allah once said in the Quran in Surah Rahman, Kullu man alayya fan wa yabqa wajhu rabbika zul jalali wal ikram. Everything will perish. Kullu man alayya fan. Fan meaning evaporate, devastate, destroy, destructive, perish, absolve, and dissolve. Anything of those words. Kullu man alayya fan. Wa and the only thing that will remain, Yabqa, from the Yabqa remain, there's another name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the 99 names, Al-Baqi, Al-Baqi, which is synonymous to Al-Akhir, Al-Baqi. Nothing is Baqi in this world. Nothing is everlasting in this universe and world except Allah, Al-Baqi. So Allah says, وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ And your Lord's existence will remain glorified be. And Allah is apparent, meaning Allah is everywhere. When people ask, especially atheists, you know, prove me there is God. How can I understand there is God? Well, this whole universe, this system that is running, this whole synchronized way of this universe that is running, the planets, the orbits, the sun, the moon, the stars. You think this is by chance? This is by coincidence? Is this is just made by monkeys or they just came in, in, in existence on their own. If that is the case, why can't we, they come in existence again? Why can't a new planet come into existence on its own? Why can't a new sun come out in existence? So therefore, these creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is apparent through his creations. Allah is apparent through his systems. When we learn physics, when we learn chemistry, when we learn biology, when we learn sciences, what are we basically learning? We are learning the formulas and the strategies and the systems and the flows that Allah has made, which we call nature, the natural system flow and, and the natural laws of nature that Allah has put it in place so that the system can run its own. Allah does not need to be a caretaker on a day-to-day -day basis. He just said, kun fayakun, be, and it became. Once it became, now it's running on its own. It's an autopilot, cruise control. And that is a sign of Allah of law here. Wherever you see, wherever you go, you go to the moon, you go to the space station, you go to the other Earth, I mean, the other planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Mercury, wherever you want to go, it's Allah of law here. Yet, he is al -Batin. he is hidden. We cannot see him with the naked eye. Nobody has been able to see him with the naked eye. Nobody can hear him, but he hears us. And Allah is aware and knowledgeable of everything that is in this world. So Allah SWT is informing us that nothing is hidden. As we go to that, to understand that when Allah is apparent, he is also hidden because we can have not seen him and we cannot see him. But we shall see him in Akhirah. As the Prophet told us, that when we, when the Muslims go to Jannah, or those who are believers in Allah SWT, from all the Prophets of Allah, when they go, enter into Jannah, they will there get to see Allah SWT. So it will become very clear to us over there. But Allah SWT here is informing us through this, وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ شَيْنْ عَلِيمٌ He is aware of everything he has knowledge of everything nothing escapes his knowledge nothing you know goes away from his ability to account for the things that are in this world so if we move on to verse number four uh let's see what's verse number four here yes yes <laughs> يَعْلَمُ مَا يَلِجُ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَمَا يَخْرُجُ مِنْهَا وَمَا يَنْزِلُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ وَمَا يَعْرُجُ فِيهَا وَهُوَ مَعْكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ وَاللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرًا A slightly long ayah where Allah is saying هو الذي خلق السماوات والأرض He is the one who created the heavens and the earth في ستة أيام in six days literally speaking yeah it means six days but here in Arabic language it does not mean six days as in six specific days, like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It means six stages or phases, as the ulama of Tafsir tell us. Sitta to atwar. Atwar means phases or rounds, six rounds or six stages or six phases that Allah created the heavens and the earth. There's a very long 
hadith in Bukhari, Sahih Bukhari, which tells us what Allah created on the first day, what Allah created on the second day. We don't have time for that. But here, what we need to understand is that Allah SWT created the, earth, the whole universe, earth and skies and heavens and everything in six days or six stages of life. Not literally six days, as our brothers and sisters from other faiths, especially uh, Judaism and Christianity, believe that God created the earth in six days or God created the universe in six days and hence he rested on the seventh day that is a very uh, corrupted belief system obviously it is against Tawheed it is shirk to even think that God rested on the seventh day and also we can extrapolate that to even say that if we you know say that God created the world in six days that is also a form of shirk because of course Allah SWT is not limited by time when we say God created the everything in six days you are limiting Allah's power and authority and remember Allah is infinite Allah is unlimited Allah is Samad and one of the meaning of Samad is omnipotent self-sufficient unlimited unrestricted Summa Sala Arsh, when he created this whole universe in six stages and phases he then rose over the throne of course, for this, this is one of the ayat mutashabihat. It is not ayat muhkamat, because a lot of times people give ta'wil or meaning to these ayats. But the aqidah of the salaf al salih and the aqidah of the sunnah, ahl sunnah, is that Allah created the earth and the heavens and everything in six stages and then he rose. What we know is al istiwa ma'loom. We know that he rose. Wal mahiya laysa ma'loom, majhul. This is Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. He says that the rising over the throne is an apparent, is known, and it's kafiya or it's mahiya, it's how, the how he rose over the throne. It's unknown. Allah did not talk about it. Allah did not discuss about it. So let, so let us not even delve into it. And if we ever get any thought from shaitan, from waswas of shaitan, that how did Allah rose over the throne? Does it mean that Allah has a body, Allah has a hand or a leg or something? These are the dangerous and treacherous thoughts that we need to say, a'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem from it, and not even entertain them in our mind, because it would lead us to shirk, and we want to purify ourselves from that. Then Allah SWT tells us, يَعْلَمُ يَلْمَا يَلِجُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Allah knows, Allah knows what enters into the earth. يَلِجُوا means يَدْخُلُوا, إِدْخَالُ, entering. So Allah is basically telling us about His authority, about His power. That He knows what enters into earth and He knows what exits from it. Meaning the rain, the fertilizer, the seeds, and also the whatever comes out of it in terms of from the land, the crops and the fruits and vegetables and everything. And whatever descends from the skies, whether there's rain or meteors or anything or spaceships, and whatever ascends to it over there also, whatever goes up to the heavens and earth. So I know I'm running over time. Let me quickly finish off. Maybe you can cut down the question and answer a little bit. And uh, we can finish this seven verses. And Allah is with you wherever you are. Allah is well aware and understanding and seeing whatever you are doing and, and whatever you are of in, in 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 the in the surveillance of Allah SWT. Basically, this and before tells us that we are under constant 24 hour surveillance of Allah SWT. Think of it, my dear brothers, as that, that, you know, nowadays we have technology, we have CCTV camera everywhere, you know, in a moment, second, we can find out what's going on here and there. Think of it in that same way, extrapolate in a bigger way that Allah is watching us and aware of us everywhere. And not just us, but every creation in this world, in this universe. And whatever is in the skies and the heavens and whatever is on earth, nothing escapes from his knowledge, his awareness. And then verse number five and six, Allah SWT tells us that he owns everything in the heavens and the earth. And it is for our own benefit. It is for us that Allah has given us the earth and the sun and the moon and the stars. <laughs> to Allah returns all the affairs, all the matters. Meaning whatever amal we do, they go to Allah SWT. Whatever we do, Allah, everything turns to it and Allah owns the heavens and the earth it is from the blessing of Allah SWT that he has given us night and day he turns the night into day and turns the day into night he allows the 
sun and moon to rotate in orbit. He allows the sun and moon to come out every day, every night, so that we are given these two blessings. Ask the people who have six months of daylight throughout the time every single day and ask the people who have six months of night time throughout the day, every day, every night. So therefore, from learning from that, that this is a blessing, just to have day and night every single day is a big blessing from Allah SWT, which Allah is highlighting to us. Because the people who don't have this blessing, they are literally being, you know, suffering from a lot. Now we come to the actual and the last and final verse, which is the cornerstone or the bedrock of this whole seven verses. In the first six verses, why did Allah talk about his majesty, his authority, his power, his dignity, his respect, his honor? Because Allah wants to emphasize and stress verse number seven. What is Allah telling us in verse number seven? آمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا جَعَلَكُمْ مُسْتَخْلِفِينَ فِيهِ فَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَأَنْفَقُوا لَهُمْ أَجْرٌ كَدِيرٌ Allah SWT is saying that believe in Allah SWT. آمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ Believe in Allah SWT and His Messenger, Rasulullah SAW. <coughs> and belief is not enough. With belief is connected monetary transaction. وَأَنْفِقُوا And give in the path of Allah. Spend your money, spend your wealth. Because your wealth is not your wealth. That's what Allah is saying in this ayah. Allah is saying, وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا جَعَلَكُمْ جَعَلَ means to appoint, to adopt, to something. So Allah has made us mustakhlifin. Mustakhlifin comes from the root word of khalifa, khalaf. Meaning Allah has made us a caretaker, a deputy over the money that he has given us. Meaning the money we have is not our money. It may be, we may be fooling ourselves that we earned the money. I, I did the job eight, 10 hours a day. I have the salary. I have my business, my profit. But basically that money is Allah's money. And that's why Allah is saying, spend from that money that I have made you as a khalifa, as a caretaker. Meaning you are given this money as a trust, as an amana. You have to spend it in the right places and don't waste the money in the wrong places. Allah says, those who believe from amongst you and they spend in the path of Allah SWT, they have a great, great big reward because they will be seeing the reward in the hereafter. And that is why <clears throat> just want to finish with this, that Allah SWT in this word, is asking us to revive our Iman, renew our Iman. Just like Rasulullah said, Jaddidu Imanukum. Qila kayfa ya Rasulullah Sallam. Rasulullah said, Jaddidu, Tajdeed, you know, renew your Iman. So it was it was said to him, one of the Sahaba said, Kayfa ya Rasulullah, how can we renew our Iman? What should we do to renew our Iman? So Rasulullah said, Qulu la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Rasulullah said, say from your tongue, utter the words that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. By saying la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah times a day, thousand times a day, we are reviving our iman. We are renewing our iman. Otherwise, iman decreases, decreases and dwindles down to such a small level that we just remain Muslim by name. There are thousands of Muslims out there who are just Muslim by name. Are they empty of Iman? No, they have an Iman. That's why they affiliate themselves or associate themselves with Islam, Iman. But their Iman is so dead low that you don't see them praying, you don't see them fasting, you don't see them praying Eid, you don't see them doing Sadaqah, you don't see them doing anything. They're just Muslim by name. So that is why in this ayah, this is the crux of the whole issue in these seven verses, that in this ayah Allah is saying, strengthen your Iman. It's a constant struggle. Iman increases and decreases. And uh, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, said that Al-Iman yazidu wa yanqis, yazidu bil ta'a wa yanqisu bil isyan. He, rahimahullah, said that Iman increases and decreases. It increases with obedience of Allah by worship, ibadat, sadaqah, hukuk al-ibad, helping others, and all these things. And Iman decreases with disobedience of Allah SWT, like sins and whatever we do and all these things. So therefore, my dear brothers, I end with this saying that this whole summary of tonight's uh, seven verses is focus on our Iman. We need to constantly struggle to build the reservoirs of our Iman. Iman needs to be increased so much in our hearts so that we reach the level of nafsul mutma'inna, as Allah mentioned in Surah Fajr. Ya ayyatu nafsul mutma'inna, irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatun mardiyya. Look, Allah says to the nafsul mutma'inna, that all oh, you peaceful soul, return to Allah 
in such a way that you are pleased with Allah and Allah is pleased with you. Which means that our constant struggle of Iman is to make it reach that level where our nafs becomes mutma'inna with Allah. May Allah give us profit, may Allah give us effort, such, inshallah, and I end with this. Jazakallah khair, Imam Jawad, that's uh, really great, mashallah. So we'll uh, start with the Q&A session. Um, those people who are on the webinar, please submit your questions in writing uh, using the questions tab, uh, and uh, I will take a selection of those and, and ask them to the presenter. So inshallah, the first question, is there supposed to be a balance between spending out of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us versus saving? Uh, is there a balance between spending and saving? Is that the question? Is Yes. Balance. I don't know what they mean by balance, the person. There's no such thing as balance. When Allah says spend, he says spend. Um, and there is no concept of uh, connecting spending with saving. Yes, at the same time, Allah does say that you save because we see in Surah Kahf, in Surah 18, which we read every Friday to save ourselves from the jail, in that there's a story of Khidr and Musa Islam, And when they were going, they built a wall. The reason being that Khidr told Musa that there is a Yatim sons and their father left behind some treasure in the ground. So Allah told Khidr to build a wall to protect that treasure so that the children, when they grow up, they can use that money. Which proves what? That Allah allows saving. But the question is technically incorrect to say, is there a balance? There's never a balance because if you look at all the ayats in the Quran about in Allah encourages us very highly that keep spending in the path of Allah. You know, spend so much like Abu Bakr, empty your whole house. So the, the, the answer to the question is that if you are thinking of a balance, that's incorrect. There is no such thing as a balance. But if the question is meant that can we save while we spend also in the path, Path of Allah? Yes, definitely. Should we save more than we, than we spend? No, that is not right. We should be spending more than we are saving, and we only save enough to fulfill the requirements and necessities of our daily lives and our children, what we may leave behind. So, a second question here is the word mutawar was used in the beginning of the webinar. Can you explain this word? Which word was that? You were a bit choppy, that word. Um, mutawar. Mutawar? I didn't use that. I, I think you used the word, I, I think it's, the question isn't correct um, in the way the word is phrased, but I think you used a word to refer to the type of surah that was described where um, the praise of Allah um, is used oh, in the, the surah. Maybe you can just Musab repeat the word and explain it. Yeah, it's called Musabbihat. Musabbihat. Meme seen baha. Musabbihat, which comes from Sabbaha. That word basically means the glorifiers. These are the surahs that glorify Allah SWT. Musabbihat. Okay, the title of today's webinar was How Well Do You Know Allah? And uh, you, you went through the verses um, in this surah. Um, talking about the names of attributes of Allah. How can we best self-evaluate ourselves for how well do we actually know Allah? What advice do you give us to be critical of ourselves? Number one, how much Iman we have. Are we measuring our Iman? Is there a barometer, a tool, an instrument that we are measuring our Iman? The first thing out of all these seven verses, the first thing we should do is self-reflection, self-accountability, uh, in, in seclusion somewhere, either in the masjid, in a house somewhere where you're alone, and pondering our, on ourself with our relationship with Allah. Do I feel a gulf between me and Allah? Do I feel a very farther distance or do I feel the closeness? Because the higher the Iman is in our soul, in our sanru, the more closeness we will feel Allah SWT. Second thing, if once Iman and closeness is there, how well do we know Allah is through His attributes, His names. Rasulullah SAW said, whoever memorizes the 99 names of Allah, of course that goes without saying by meaning, like not just memorizing the names, Arabic names, but also knowing the meanings. 
and implements them in their life, for them Jannah is guaranteed. So the more names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we know, the more chances of getting closer to Allah and the more chances of getting to Jannah. Now, how do the names of Allah help us? We mentioned some names today in this surah that we saw. The names basically, once we know the names by heart and we know the meanings of the names, we can then use them in our dua. Dua is a tool and a weapon of a believer to get closer to Allah and also to remove obstacles and hurdles in our life. So if I know the names of Allah SWT, then I can use those names in the various du'as that I make to Allah for my various necessities. For example, when I am asking Allah for forgiveness, I can say, Ya Allah, Ya Ghaffar, Ya Allah, Ya Ghaffur, Ya Allah, Ya Tawab, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Allah, Ya Rahim. Or like Rasulullah said, Ya Awalu, Ya Akhiru, Ya Zahiru, Ya Ba'atinu. You know, so when we are praising Allah SWT, because when we love someone in this world, we praise them a lot, don't we? So if we love Allah SWT from the bottom of our heart and we know his names, then we call upon him with his beautiful names. And that's what Allah says in the Quran, that call upon Allah using his beautiful names. So that is how we know Allah well, if we know his names. The question or the take home recipe or the homework tonight that everyone who's attending should take is that how many names of the 99 names of Allah do I know? Is it 10, 20, 15, 30, 40? The higher you are, the more closer you are to 99. That means the more closer you are to Allah. The less names you know by heart tonight, that means the farther away you are from Allah. And we should make an effort that before we die, at least we memorize these 99 names. Can you clarify whether the Prophet وسلم, has already seen Allah? No, that's a very clear hadith in Bukhari, in Sahih Bukhari, from two narrations, from uh, one from Aisha Rizalana and also one from Abu Huraira, where Aisha Rizalana she said that I asked Allah, I asked Rasulullah that Ya Rasulullah Hal Ra'ita Rabban, and he said Ya Aisha Ra'itu Nuran. Translation, she said that I asked the Prophet of Allah وسلم, that did you see Allah in Miraj? And he said, Oh Aisha, I only saw no light, full of light. So that tells us that Allah SWT has not shown himself neither to Musa Islam who requested that on earth and nor to Muhammad وسلم, who was all the way so close up there by the Arsh in Miraj. There are a number of questions um, asking about the balance between spending and saving. Um, and I, I think people are wanting more guidance on what proportions should be spent and highlighting the examples of um, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq, Hazrat Umar, how each of them spent either all of their wealth or half of their wealth. In, in particular situations, um, is there a formula for how much to spend? The Quran gives us a formula of one fifth that we should spend in the path of Allah, one fifth of whatever we earn. That is the highest or maximum amount. Of course, the maximum can be everything, 100%. But in Surah An Fair, Allah SWT says that whatever you earn in terms of you know, provisions, uh, of course, that ayah over there refers to the spoils of war, the mal that you would attain during the battlefields from the enemy combatant places. But of course, scholars have said that if when someone wants to come to the issue of spending and they want to make a formula, that is a very good formula that Allah gives, which is 20% of your wealth. But if you want to get more than that, surely that is easier. <laughs> But I know people always have this question, if we are spending, then what about saving? The basic necessity that we have in our daily lives, we can save only for that. And the rest we can spend in the path of Allah. So the Quran has not given a clear cut formula for that, known as the Rasulullah Sallam in his hadith. But the different actions of different Sahaba, the different ayahs, like I said about in Surah and fal they give us some kind of a guideline of what we can do. Because uh, spending wealth in the path of Allah is connected with Iman. 
the higher the iman of the person, the more tawakkal in Allah, the more tawakkal in Allah, the more they'll be spending in the path of Allah. And obviously, when the more they are spending in the path of Allah and they are saving less for their family, for their expenses and necessities, the more Allah will take care of them when those expenses arise for them in their daily life. Okay, very good. Um, can you clarify um, the importance of intention uh, when spending? Intention. Intention should be to please Allah and that's it and nothing else. It should not be for, for praising or fame or, or status, but rather to please Allah SWT and get his pleasure. Okay. When Allah SWT said that he created the universe in six days or six stages, do we know anything about how long each stage was in terms of days as we know them today? No, we don't. Okay. So I think with that, we'll end. So, um, Jazakallah Khair, uh, Imam Jawad, that's really a great presentation and great Q&A. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to uh, act on what we've heard today. Uh, we'll continue, inshallah, uh, next week. Uh, same time, 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Um, next week's webinar will be delivered by Dr. Ahmed uh, Mutawalli. Um, with that, we'll conclude, inshallah. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruk wa atubu alayk. Awudu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal asr. Inna l-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-lazina amunu wa amilu s-sanihat. Wa tawasaw bil-haq. Wa tawasaw bil-sab. Sadaq Allahum lazim.